as I think everybody has acknowledged and alluded to, like the information right now, it's just so hard to sift through. I think coming together and just kind of getting everybody as much as we can, you know, working together on the same page to, to figure out what is actually happening. What do we know? What do we not know? You know, right now, I think that's one of the biggest questions is uh, <laughs> we don't even know what we don't know. <laughs> so um, at any rate, so as Molly said, I graduated from YSU in 2017. And then afterward, I went to work at the Cleveland Clinic in the neuro ICU. Uh, I started there in August and I worked there for uh, almost two and a half years until December. I was there full time and I decided to start travel nursing. That was something I wanted to do um, well before ever going to nursing school. It's just an opportunity, you know, to go across the country, meet new people, experiences, uh, patient populations, um, you know, and, and uh, it doesn't hurt that you make a little bit of extra money along the way for displacing your home. So. Uh, at any rate, I decided that I wanted to do all of that, and it just so happened that my first assignment, which started in December and, and went until the uh, April 12th, and then, you know, it was 10 days ago, and now here we are, um, happened to be during what ended up being a global pandemic. So um, it's become very interesting and, and probably a little bit a uh, different travel experience than what I would say a vast majority of people have had. Um, just to kind of give you guys an idea of like travel nursing in general, it's typically, and I don't want to get into this stuff too much because whatever, there's more important part, portions to talk about, but it's typically you would sign for a three month contract in hospital systems that just are having struggling filling their staffing needs, whether they um, had a mass exodus, whether, uh, you know, sometimes they had a new unit open, they don't have enough staffing for, um, so to train a new graduate, it takes about three months of orientation. So a traveler is expected to walk in, be experienced, and you get two days of orientation, and then you start uh, on your own. So it, it's it's a lot different experience. Um, you know, you, you're expected to know your stuff, be able to handle it, and do it immediately. Um, that's why now my group of workers, our travel nurse uh, group, is, is so essential in this time and, and is becoming more and more needed, you know, and, and they're being deployed at more rapid rates than ever. Um, you know, is because again, that's that's the type of work environment that we're used to. Is you walk in, sometimes you don't even get an orientation. You're just told, "Hey, here's where you're working." Um, you know, you come in a half hour early and you start your shift. So um, that's kind of why this subsect is really being used so much and is so important in this particular setting per se. Um, it's you know, again, it's just so much different than being a staff nurse. Even if I was a trained ICU nurse. Uh, taking a job that was full time somewhere, I would probably get two to four weeks of an orientation. So it's just a lot different look. Um, as she said, so in, in Virginia, I mean, I guess we can talk a little bit about, uh, so I guess first I'll say, you know, that first assignment, I do want to go to the patient experience there and uh, what that was kind of like and, and how that was affecting that, but uh, how COVID has been affecting uh, to explain to why I'm in LA, right? Uh, California has actually really been ahead. They've been dampening their curve. But for whatever reason, out of their cases, you know, there's 33,000 in California right now, for which for the populace of the state is not a lot of cases. Um, 15,000 are in LA County. And uh, out of the 12,000 uh, or 1,200 deaths, 650 are in LA County as well. So LA County, uh, whether, I mean, we don't know why yet, uh, maybe some retrospective data analysis, maybe, uh, you know, with higher homeless population, higher population density. I mean, I, I don't know exactly what has caused LA to progress quicker, um, but that's ultimately why I wound up here is because it is a field hospital. Um, they're taking a closed hospital that was uh, formerly St. Vincent Medical Center that had uh, closed from bankruptcy. And so the state is leasing the building to deploy emergency um, staffing. So everyone staffing this hospital is all travelers from the physicians to pharmacy to nursing to housekeeping none of us are permanent staff there um and the hospital opened on the 13th so they opened last monday um so i'm really coming into something new um basically none of us have any idea what it's supposed to look like they're hiring a health, health system out in california uh, called kaiser is they they're paying them a monthly fee for management um so we all are just kind of coming in with you know hitting the ground running the Kind of wanted to paint that picture to to point out the stark contrast from what my experience was thus far with the COVID patients, and that uh, I was in Virginia in a hospital system that just I was working in the neuro ICU. They were just short um, because they had a management turnover and they lost about forty five nurses in six months. So um, there was quite a few of us there that were traveling, 
and this pandemic, you know, like I said, they had just been hiring travelers since November and that was just kind of where we were at. And all of a sudden, you know, things started to turn. God bless you. Um, so, you know, as things started to turn, uh, you know, this, this went from a very, so typically in a hospital setting, just so you guys kind of have an idea, an ICU nurse, that's a very general term. There's typically much more subsect than that. So the Cleveland Clinic, we have a neuro ICU with two units. We have five medical ICUs. We have four surgical ICUs. We have uh, about 12 cardiac ICUs, right? So I couldn't even walk over to cardiac and cross transfer my skills there. Like I would be lost in an open heart uh, surgery uh, unit, even though I'm an ICU trained nurse. Um, a lot of that right now is being pushed to the wayside. And what most of us are, are just medical ICU nurses that are being, whether you have experience or not, you're being trained to be a COVID nurse. Um, so at that hospital, what they did immediately is on the fourth floor, we had the medical ICU, which ran 42 beds. Um, every single room got converted to negative pressure, which is something that allows us to, uh, to, to treat COVID patients safely. So I guess kind of talking about the disease primarily, right? We're wearing these masks because it's droplet, uh, which is typically how the flu is spread, correct? So saliva, mouth to mouth, mouth, uh, you know, saliva to eyes, something of that case is crossed in how it's transferred. Um, in, in the presence of an aerosolizing procedure, so a breathing tube being placed, or um, certain levels of oxygen, like positive airway pressure. Am I cut out? You're still here, Billy. I think Molly, she she kind of cut out, but you are still here. <laughs> okay, cool. My, my screen is like cut down. Okay, um, so when we do aerosolizing procedures, like, uh, like I said, putting in a breathing tube, so intubation, um, high flow oxygen, high um, airway pressure, like CPAP or BiPAP, uh, that makes it be able to live in a droplet setting, okay? So it's no longer if you spit and it gets on me and I get it into myself. It's now able to uh, sit at a, it's a smaller molecule and it sits in the air and can settle. So now you coughing, I can just be walking and it can be in the air and settle onto me and the things I'm wearing. Um, so that's where then you have to escalate this level of, of type type of, of prevention that you need, and that's where you need the droplet precaution. So that's where you're seeing maybe in some of the international stuff where people wearing Tyvek suits, right? Those big white suits that look like space suits, and you're seeing those on special respirator masks and things like that. That's where that's so essential. So the negative pressure is a system that's gonna essentially continually pull air and then run it through a filter and recycle it to prevent those droplets from ever being able to fall onto anything. Um, and what we're seeing is, is that that needs to be deployed at levels we just don't have. So for instance, at that hospital, we had 10, 10 beds that have negative pressure because there's so few diseases that typically require that type of treatment. Uh, essentially, the only things that I've ever used it for is TB, tuberculosis, and measles. Um, I've only taken care of five of those patients in my three plus years. So. That is one of the biggest problems with the system right now. And then kind of bridging that, that's what has made this, you know, flattening the curve so, so essential is that our infrastructure in healthcare is not set up on the gross level whatsoever to, to really handle this influx of those needs, you know? Um, so it's not even just hospital beds. It's not even just ventilators. Uh, to be able to actually protect your staff, we need to actually renovate those rooms. And so that's what they started doing. And they, they brought in a 24 hour construction crew and they could convert six rooms in 24 hours. And they did that straight across their medical ICU. So first they did all 42 medical ICU beds. And that was in about the first week that we really started seeing cases. The next week, my, my unit was converted. So I went from being in a neuro ICU, taking care of strokes and brain bleeds and, and purely neuro, neuro population to the entire unit being converted to negative pressure and about three quarters of our patient population becoming COVID. Uh, we then cross-trained all of the step-down nurses to take care of neuro ICU patients. So right now there's actually a, essentially any hospital system is putting out surveys on to ask their healthcare workers if they've had any previous experience in emergency in ICU. And they're actually asking for volunteers and in, in some cases essentially just forcing uh, a relocation because that's where we're at right now as far as needing you know resources and so again that's some of the just just a little peek at some of what we're trying to do on the healthcare system side that is is so important to have that extra time and have that you know why like 
why is this flattening curve so important, right? Because eventually we're all going to open back up and the spread is going to be there. I mean, there will be more cases. There will be more deaths. I mean, that is a raw reality of, of, of this situation. You know, the, the flattening the curve isn't going to prevent this forever, right? Uh, we, we have to open up. Uh, all of these things are going to happen. Um, but these are some of the, the finite things that are being, being done. And so the next thing then, I guess, to talk about with Virginia is, you know, so basically they made a plan to convert their entire hospital. Every ICU bed is being converted to negative pressure. So they will have about 300 in capacity. Um, we purchased 250 spare ventilators um, the day that we got our first case. They pulled old ventilators that were in storage out of commission and were retraining us on old models. Um, you know, basically tapping into any resource hole that is possible. And that's what health sy systems across the country are doing in different capacities, depending on your, your ability. At the Cleveland Clinic, they have about 600 to 800 ICU beds right now. They're actually converting the education center to a 1,000 bed emergency ICU setting. Um, they anticipate that by the end of the year, they'll be able to take 5,000 ICU patients if needed. Um, so they are kind of ramping up to be prepared to be the epicenter for if Ohio were to get significantly worse, right? Um, and so again, that's just some of the things I've heard. And, you know, these were, that was just what my manager told me that was being talked about in Grand Browns, you know, um, some of that's underway, some of it's yet to be, you know, some of it's speculatory maybe, but at any rate, it is things that we're kind of move, seeing movement towards. So um, I guess, you know, to talk a little bit more about the pace, I think that's what at least some people want to know is what's this window looking like, right? So a vast majority of your people that are going to have this um, aren't necessarily feeling all that bad, right? If you look at our cases versus the amount of people that have been critically ill, and, and again, also to testing capacity, uh, we've been pretty slow at testing for a long time. So there is that question of how many people have had it. Um, you know, once we get antibody testing and look at this retrospectively, how many people are going to test with antibodies and show that they probably already did beat it and it was a mild form and they were asymptomatic, right? Um, the problem is that at this point, the, the, the people that we are seeing in the health systems are getting quite sick and it's really just come to light within the last couple of weeks. It was actually something, um, I, I don't have the excerpt in front of me and I don't want to butcher it, but I, I am friends with a couple of physicians. One of the guys uh, I worked with in Cleveland, um, mutual friend through him, he was working in New York and, you know, he made a very extensive post about how in essence he felt that, uh, he called himself the Grim Reaper. He's an ICU doc. And he said that every time he walks in to have a patient uh, FaceTime their family, he, he would tell them that he felt truly that it was likely the last time he would talk to their family and he couldn't, couldn't do anything about it, okay? And that's probably one of the scariest feelings as a medical professional. 99% of the time when a patient rolls in my door, I already know what I'm doing before they even get there. If I know that you're a subarachnoid bleed, I know exactly what I'm going to do to help you and prevent it prevent furthering worsening before you walk in my door. This disease, we know you have it and we still don't know what's an effica efficacious treatment for it. And that is what is scaring and making it so difficult for us. Um, so when you, you know, you read a post where it says, you know, a guy who's been an ICU doc for 20 years and he feels that he's literally treating these people blindly and that he's just walking over graves, you know, and out of the three, four, five people he's putting a breathing tube in a night, these people are dying. Um, there was some recent things that have started to come out and some research has started to come out um, that's really started to shed a light on why this has been, okay? Um, without getting too, too far into healthcare, I don't want to get too in-depth and, you know, boots deep in the water, but um, this picture looks a lot like uh, what you call ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, especially on a CT scan, okay? So we're going to get a CT scan and you see what's called this ground glass um, opacity. Uh, so it, it's this... And you can actually, I mean, if anybody cares to, I could send an email with like the verbiage of this stuff. If you would want to Google it, you can Google anything like that. And you could look at it. Um, but it's basically this deep white, it's, it's damaged it's inflammation that's in the bases and builds up through lungs. And it's always bilateral. So a lot of times in pneumonia, you would see this in like one lobe or the other, like where that disease is really taken. And you would maybe see some ground glass infiltrate in the right lower lobe, let's say. Okay. And so you could say that suspect pneumonia. These patients are having very severe ground glass opacities bilaterally always it is always 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 bilateral and it's something that has made very very little sense to us right so we've been treating these patients as a pneumonia and an arts patient because they're going into respiratory failure so we haven't understood you know why we just know that they're having damage to their lungs and they're going into respiratory failure 
Um, so we've been kind of doing that. And, and finally, in recent days, things have started to come together and, and make a little bit more sense, at least as we scratch the surface. So what's happening is um, when, so I'm trying to think of the best way. So in your lungs, you have these little sacs, alveoli, right? These grape-like sacs that are these little things, and that's where the gas exchange happens. So that's where you breathe in air, the little, you know, alveoli, there's a separation, oxygen, and your blood there then has, um, you know, hemoglobin molecules that are going to pick up that oxygen. Well, what's happening in this case is that the COVID operates a lot like a CO2 poisoning, if it, or carbon dioxide poisoning, if anybody's ever heard of that, where it actually binds to your hemoglobin and does not allow oxygen to be bound. So you're slowly becoming lower levels of oxygen, but it's not because your lungs aren't working right. Your lungs are doing the work exactly how they're supposed to. They're breathing perfectly, they're pumping air perfectly, but the blood itself has lost its capacity to pick up the oxygen that's being provided. And so what that's causing then is a hypoxia that's progressing with no signs. So patients sit at home for days, not knowing they were sick, not feeling it until they have gotten much, much worse because this cascade works in three ways. As you are not able to pick up oxygen, right? You become low level. So then your other organs aren't getting, your brain, your liver, your kidneys, your other organs that are operating aren't getting that oxygen. On top of that, then two other things happen. Your body triggers, uh, your kidneys start trying to produce erythropoietin at an extreme rate because they feel that they don't have blood cells that, are, you know, your body knows your blood cells aren't carrying oxygen appropriately. So it goes into overdrive trying to produce these, these red blood cells and produce the components you need to handle that. Um, and it actually essentially works themselves into failure because they produce so many between the autoimmune response and the cytokines that are produced. And then as well as the, um, you know, EPO production and all of these things, it's putting your kidneys onto overdrive and it can't compensate. The same things then happening as, as your body, um, it's affected by COVID. Again, I don't want to get too deep in this, but basically as the body gets affected by the COVID, the other thing that's happening is that these iron molecules that typically are locked up in, in a sealed chamber can be very toxic to your body, but are typically kept safely in these heaps. okay? What's happening right now is that they're being released when the COVID takes that spot on the hemoglobin. And so now your body's also getting this oxidating, I, I don't want to butcher the term, and it's kind of leaving me. Let me see if I can find it real quick. It's, um, it's just oxidative damage. Okay. Oxidative damage. That's the word. Um, and so that's where, remember, so we're talking about the ground glass opacities. That's why, where that's coming from. So all of this excess iron that can become toxic is being left in its free form in your system and your lungs can't pull the compensatory mechanisms to, to, to overtake that. So now what we're seeing is that you're getting this buildup of this toxic, uh, you know, form of this iron into the lungs as well. And that's what's actually damaging the lungs and causing that inflammation and causing all of that, um, you know, as, as your body continues to fight and use all of its, pull all of its stops and mechanisms, that's what's really, really causing them the damage that we're seeing later on. The problem is this pinnacle and doesn't really show its head until it's on the bubble of bursting, right? So your kidneys have already been taking a massive hit. Your liver is also taking a massive hit because it's trying to lock up that iron. It actually can kind of store that iron in a different way. Um, so it's trying to do its part and, and compensate. And so all of your organs have already taken a massive hit by the time you're actually starting to really see them become symptomatic with this hypoxia. So when we have patients walking in the door, it's often 24 to 48 hours that we see a deterioration because they maybe been five to seven days plus post exposure. Um, I don't. Does anybody have any questions about like that at all before? Like, I, then we can just kind of move on from like you guys kind of understand the disease process and stuff a little bit. Is everybody cool with that? Okay, so. I mean, basically, yeah, like I said, that's, that's kind of what's going on there. And that's why these patients are probably some of the sickest I've ever seen and deteriorate faster than I've ever seen. Um, you know, when the first patient I took care of with COVID in Virginia, 
Uh, the first night I had them was Friday night. I came to work at 7 p.m. They were on two liters of oxygen nasal cannula, which is just a very, very minimally invasive type of oxygen delivery. Uh, by the time I came back the next evening, they were on the highest amount of oxygen without being intubated. Um, within four hours of my shift, we'd put in a breathing tube, a central line, an arterial line. We had to sedate and paralyze them so we could totally control their lung movements with a ventilator. We then had to do what's called proning. So you flip the patient onto their belly. Uh, I will grab that in one second. So tip, we will flip them uh, onto their belly um, because it helps with lung expansion. That's something that I've only done four times prior to COVID. I've now almost proned, I'd say, 20 patients. Um, so again, just the, 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 the vast difference in, in, in how quickly this is happening and how aggressive it's happening. Once it builds up and your body's compensatory mechanisms are down, it just goes. Um, what from the speculation we saw there, uh, they anticipated about a two week period of severe sickness. Um, to be honest, I didn't, a lot of the patients I was caring for either I didn't see through or didn't have great outcomes. Um, but a lot of them were pretty critically ill for a solid week plus. What we found though, when we started to understand the path of behind this is it's actually best to avoid a breathing tube longer than we typically would. So something we were doing early is intubating when you see signs of respiratory distress because that's what we do. But we're actually finding now that breathing tubes as well as positive airway pressure, so like a BiPAP or CPAP that somebody had for sleep apnea, um, significantly exacerbates the potential respiratory issues. So we're actually now treating it very differently and taking a lot of ICU patients that are sitting on what's called high flow nasal cannula. So it's a heated nasal cannula. It provides a much higher level of oxygen. You can put it on a percent FiO2. So you can run them at 50 to 70%. And even though their oxygen levels may be dropping and they may even start working at breathing, we will let them go for hours to days beyond, hoping that we can bring them back from the brink by trying to limit that with some of our, you know, preliminary treatments we're doing, like the azithromycin and uh, hydroxychloroquine or what have you, um, you know, so we kind of contain that enough and we keep them right on that edge without being intubated. And I think that that change is 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 providing some pro positive results. Actually, when I floated to a medical step down down there, um, we were seeing some patients that were sitting on high flow at settings I typically would not be comfortable with, and they were staying there for days and staying stable. Um, so typically, you know, I would have walked into work and been like, what are we doing? This patient needs a breathing tube. Um, however, you know, we are seeing some initial success in, in patients living in those levels, you know, that maybe we typically wouldn't be comfortable with. Um, you know, I, I think that that kind of sums that up. So uh, at any rate, let me go back to my notes here. Um, you know, that, that's kind of, I guess, what brings me to the next point I'm at, you know, so like I said, these patients are very, very sick. They are sicker than mostly anything I've ever taken care of, and they deteriorate faster than most things I've seen. Um, I, the, the, one of the biggest challenges, again, is that we just don't know what works. Um, so a lot of times, you know, there's a saying that is sometimes used, and pardon the language, but we're throwing shit at the wall to see what sticks. That's the reality. Um, you know, and, and that's something that, you know, some physicians I've talked to have said, you know, I, I, when I typically, we're doing something I don't understand, I ask why we're doing it. And you just kind of get a half smile and say, <laughs> you know, because we don't know what else to do. Um, so obviously the CDC did approve the preliminary use of the hydroxychloroquine on May 31st. Um, the problem is with any medication and any use, we, we haven't studied the side effects enough yet, right? So our best, most likely option for moving forward from this is finding a treatment that's already a treatment for, other, for another disease versus its own medication in that a new medication, you have to develop all, you know, you're doing all of your side effect testing, you're doing everything, you have to do your full risk assessment. Um, whereas for another established medication, your risk assessment is primarily done it's just finding efficacy for the current disease you're treating. Um, that's not to say that finding a new drug isn't eventually a long-term solution, but that's why right now you'll see a lot of focus on drugs that are already on the market to treat other things. And it's a very common practice in medicine that you'll see this black box use or off-label use. Um, 
It's because we can just get through trial phasing so much quicker and we already kind of have an idea of what patient population might be at risk by trying this drug. Um, with that being said, you know, we're just so early and that's where probably what has made this the most difficult. Um, you know, you saw internationally, you saw now, you know, in our own country, but even as the wave spread quickly and Italy was hit very, very hard, you know, in some of these countries um, with just how quickly this disease is spreading and then how little we've known about treatment, it has just made things uh, extraordinarily difficult um, to, to really get ahead of things and then progress in a manner that, that feels positive or like we're actually, you know, making, we're covering ground. Um, you know, so I guess where I'd like to go with this is kind of saying, you know, so so I'm talking a lot of negative news. I'm talking a lot of bad things. It doesn't sound good, right? Like nothing you see on the news sounds good. So I guess a lot of people are probably asking themselves, like, what are we like? What have we done? Like, you know, why why are we doing what we're doing then, right? Like, why did I have to move out of my apartment early? Why am I at home? Why am I staying home? Why can I not go to the store? Um, and the thing is, is that although what I have painted a picture of sounds very bad and morbid because I do want the raw realities of this disease to be understood, um, it's significantly, significantly better than the place that we were projected to be and definitely could be. Uh, so the social distancing has worked. I don't know if any of you really followed the IHME uh, data from the University of Washington. It's pretty much being accepted right now as the standard for predictor model. Um, so when when they were doing their projections initially, um, we are now projected. Well, not even initially. Let's just go from four one. Let's say they were projecting the U.S. to have uh, ninety three thousand deaths. Uh, as of yesterday, we're projecting to hit sixty six thousand, and we've already had forty thousand reported deaths. Um, so so the good news on that is that we are seeing a massive drop in all predictor models. Whether you go to the state to state model, um, every single state. That was that is listed has a decreased um, projection since we've been doing shutdown since we've been doing stay at home orders. Um, you know, if you look at California's data, they were the first uh, state to do a stay at home order. It was on three nineteen. Um, their curve has been significantly managed the entire time this pandemic has existed. They actually had the capacity to handle approximately twenty to twenty two thousand uh, hospitalized COVID patients at one time. Um, and they never peaked over 5,000 cases at any given time so far. Uh, if you look inversely at New York, um, you know, they are now finally slowing. So we are even seeing progress in New York, which again tells us the stay at home order is working. Um, but they're somewhere around maybe 500 deaths a day currently. Their peak, they're around 800 deaths a day in New York. But when they peaked, they had about 25,000 um, patients that needed care in hospital settings and had about 12 to 13,000 beds available. Uh, so that is why then you saw such an increase in the mortality rate so quickly for disease, right? And that's exactly what happened in Italy when everybody was saying Italy's data wasn't comparable to the rest of the, 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 the world because they were at 6 7%, right? The problem is when you no longer have the healthcare infrastructure to manage these patients, your rates are going to go through the roof. And that's what we saw on a smaller scale there in New York early. Um, so right now, you know, now that curve's finally coming down even there and they are, you know, especially too with time, they've been able to make more pop-up hospitals. They've had the Navy relief come in, they've got boats, they're treating people in different areas. And so our capacity to treat has gotten better. And therefore, you know, we've started to see a decrease finally in those numbers. Um, one thing I did just want to touch on too that a lot of people aren't aware of, and I think a lot of my friends have, you know, pointed out to me is the question exists, how does, you know, how does something that's not even as big as the flu overwhelm our health system, right? Like we don't have that many cases. 40,000 deaths is a lot of people, but it's not astronomical, right? Like we see people get sick every day. The problem is that this pandemic is being paired on top of our typical illnesses. Nobody stopped having heart attacks or strokes. Nobody stopped getting other typical diseases. Um, and so any hospital system at any given time runs at 70 to 75% capacity, give or take. So on an average day, 75% of my beds are already accounted for. A lot of hospitals that don't run at that volume don't have the staff to, to even provide for it. So if you look at a hospital, like our sister hospital in Cleveland, uh, at the Cleveland Clinic, one of their branches, the Marymount branch, 
they have an ICU that has 30 beds, but their average census for the, for the past year has been 10 to 12 patients. So they only staff six to seven nurses per shift. To fill your, your hospital, you need 15, or to fill that unit, they need 15 to 20 nurses. So they were running in four to five patients per nurse in an ICU setting that's a two to one ICU patient, a two to one ratio, typically. So that's how quickly when the patients are at the door and somebody says, we have the beds, it's not even just the beds or the ventilators, it's everything together. It's having enough healthcare employees, it's having enough beds, it's having enough vents, it's having enough medications and converting units. You know, I was talking about in Virginia, hospital was converting some of those units. It's not just that we need the negative pressure. The med rooms are all stocked differently. So the stocking of medications on an, on an ICU versus a floor uh, versus a cancer floor versus a heart floor, there's different meds that are kept there because of what's used in high volume. So if you have start putting intubated patients where they weren't before, you don't have the sedation you need. You don't have the paralytic you need. That all now has to be pre-mixed in pharmacy and sent to you. So now your pharmacy staff needs to double. That's some of the compounding issue that exists that is really not um, seen if you're not in that system. It's There's just so many more levels to it than simply saying, yes, I have a bed or yes, I have a ventilator or anything of the sort. Um, that stress comes from the ground up. And, you know, whether it's even just uh, our, our environmental services couldn't keep up with the trash because it's taking them twice as long to empty trash because of the precautions they have to follow to enter a room. It's no longer just walking in and out and foaming your hands. It's a whole get up suit that's requiring them three to four minutes longer per room to empty trash. So they can only do half of the units they were able to do in a previous world. Um, so it's just every single level, the job is getting harder, longer, and more involved. Um, and, and, you know, so that's why really the stress comes. So I want to focus now a little bit on, you know, the fact that A, what you like what we've done as far as the stay at home order what we've done as far as uprooting everyone's lives has made a massive 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 difference in where we're at we've had very few states that have been overwhelmed to the point of capacity and we've already bought enough time that most health systems especially the ones that are larger in areas have been able to start making those accommodating measures you know i'm currently in la at a field hospital they're currently under construction for two more pop-ups here in the city that's happening nationwide and so the end of the day, we know that social distancing is going to need to end. Um, the thing is right now, you know, the, the, there's so many questions of when and how and, you know, at what capacity and, and, and how quickly. The good news is that we have already made a massive impact. And so, you know, whether there's fear that we're going to open too quickly or we're going to open too many things or, you know, however you're feeling on all of those different aspects, we have made significant progress in both treatment and capacities. And so we will be able to handle what we know will be a new influx of patients. Um, it's inevitable that as we open up, there will be another wave. You know, uh, the disease isn't going away. We know that it, it's exacerbated in close contact. Um, and, and so the biggest thing is that it's, it's given us enough time to prepare for that. Um, and, and again, of course, not saying that we won't also see more systems get overwhelmed because I'm sure at some point that will happen, but we've slowly had enough groups start to be able to adapt and conform. Um, I will leave you with this. The, the current IH, IHME data has been projecting all of their numbers based on a shutdown through May, which is currently obviously not ordered, though it is ordered through April. Um, so I would, you know, obviously proceed personally with the cautions that you feel necessary and or you know, feasible if you're, you know, in a position that you are able to move forward and, you know, whether we open up or not, but you still continue to grocery shop every two weeks and still continue to generally socially distance, continue to, you know, practice certain precautions, um, you know, you're still making a difference with all of those, um, all of those steps being taken. It's not uh, for not, you know, it's not a waste of your time. Um, and even if other people are slowly not doing so, um, taking those steps, even just to protect yourself, your immediate family, et cetera, um, it, it does make a vast difference in, in how that chain gets passed along. Um, I would like to just say, you know, talk about too, like with you guys particularly, I know it's the end of a semester, it's a spot I've been in all too often um, and struggling with motivation period, you know, it's April and you're ready to be done. Um, but one thing I do want to remind and just kind of talk about is that 
like as all of this is going on, you know, there's a lot of expectation or no, yeah, there's a lot of expectation. I mean, you're all, your honor students, there's, you're, you're typically, you know, you maintain the grade points and you are involved and you run the clubs and you do all of the things and you typically step up in situations and you're a helper. And right now is some time that, you know, you may be feeling helpless, feel like your entire life's been turned upside down, have housing that you've paid for that you can't currently access, you know, the list can be a mile long. Um, but the one thing I do want to remind you of is that in the grand scheme of things in, in two years and five years, um, you know, whether it's you're trying to go to post back, whether you're looking for your dream job, you know, whatever you're doing, um, you know, nobody's going to look at it and say, oh, well, oh, yeah, you had a tough, you know, everybody does have to deal with this. And it's the people who are able to handle this adversity and persevere and come out on the other side you know, still finishing out what needs to be done, um, you know, and being able to perform on that level, those are the people that are going to be looked at and still get those nods, you know, and it's a sad reality of the fact that, you know, if, if you're a junior, if you're a sophomore and you want to go to grad school in three, four years, you know, having a bad semester because of COVID just isn't going to be an excuse that somebody wants to hear. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we do still need to get it done and put our nose to the grindstone and make it happen. And, you know, whatever it takes to just try to find some sort of way to normalize and, you know, um, just progress forward uh, and make as much of an impact as we can. And it is, it is so, so important. And again, especially because of the, you know, just who you all are as people in, in our community and in our, in our um, you know, university, it's, it really is, it, it, it is as much as it feels like this may be a waste or it may be exhausting or maybe all of these things. Um, the, the impact has been huge. It's been felt by us, you know, those of us who really understand and see what's going on and has been living this on a day-to-day -day basis, appreciate it. We know how hard it is to stay home. You know, uh, I've got my girlfriend at home going absolutely bonkers on me um, all the time and telling me that, well, you know, at least you get to leave <laughs> your house. Um, but it, it really is, it's something that has made such a massive, massive difference for us. Um, and as much thanks that, you know, healthcare workers have gotten, frontline workers have got, um, I think the common day person hasn't gotten the acknowledgement that it really does require all of us in this together and doing all of these things, um, you know, and, and so I just want to, you know, encourage you to, to just keep pushing, keep finding a way, keep, you know, just after, after your studies, after, your, you know, just get through these last couple of weeks and then, you know, just appreciate what time you have, find a new hobby, I don't know, learn how to knit, do something. <laughs> I know that it's 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 rough right now, but um, you know, again, I, I think that we're seeing a lot of promising things. Even though this really, we don't have an end line, we don't have a timeline. Um, you know, I, I do feel good about what progress we've made and what little time we've had, and the fact that we have some of the best and brightest in the world working on this all simultaneously. Um, and, and I do feel good that you know we we have brighter days ahead, uh, even if we can't say exactly.